For many of us, technology appears to be an impenetrable black box. In this episode of Five Perspectives, we will look at how technology informs storytelling and vice versa. How as artists and creators, we can use technology as a tool to push our artistic practice further. I'm Cheryl Sim, Managing Director and Curator of the Phi Foundation, and I'm your host for this Phi Perspectives episode on the balance between technology and storytelling. At the new Storytellers Conference, Ted Shilowitz, futurist at Paramount Pictures, talks about the one trait that differentiates us from all other living things and how contemporary technology is there to serve this trait. Now, this book is amazing, and there's lots of tenets and things that are fantastic in this book that are extremely illuminating and clarifying. But there's one thing that absolutely floored me, because I knew it all along, it just no one ever defined it in the way that this book defined it. There's literally one thing that human beings, us in this room, homo sapiens, can do that to our knowledge, no other species on planet Earth can do. Does anybody, don't answer if you've read the book. If you haven't read the book, take a guess. Anybody want to take a guess? I'll tell you. Say that again. Tell stories. Tell stories. That's the answer. Stand up, take a bow. <laughs> It's harder to get to that answer. You hadn't read the book. No. Fantastic. It's harder to get to that answer than you might realize. There is literally one thing that we do that nothing else on planet Earth that lives or sentient beings can do is create and tell stories, create fiction. This is a fiction, and we'll talk about that in a second. Here's some key like moments of this book. The book is giant. So these are just a couple of things to look at. As we talk about it, I'll bring them up, you can read them. These are just some things that I think are really valuable. So as you read these things, think about what we're doing right now. We've all gathered in this place. This is not real. It's artificial. Someone made this. Every single thing about this. Someone made the chairs, made the clothes you're wearing, made the fact that I have this microphone on and I'm standing here, and I've created a story dynamic here. Other animals can't do this. Imagine, in this environment like this, there's other animals that are very close to us genetically. Like one little tweak of the DNA. Imagine if instead of oh, 100 or so humans in here, there was 100 chimpanzees in here. And we asked all the chimpanzees, sit quietly in a little sloping arc and pay attention to this guy on the stage for an hour. Do you know what would happen? Chaos! If you've ever been to a sporting event, it's amazing that 90,000 people can sit in a giant thing and not kill each other almost all the time. Every once in a while, we turn into other things other than humans. But for the most part, we somehow manage to eat popcorn, eat hot dogs, 90,000 people, and nobody kills each other. That's because we tell stories. Everything about that is a fiction. This is a fiction. If it was all real, we'd be wandering around in the grass outside, like looking for grubs. This is fiction. And speaking of fiction, I like to refer to this company a lot. Now, keep in mind, I don't work for this company, right? My bosses would probably be really upset that I talk about Pixar more than I talk about Paramount. But I think this is a really valuable company to talk about because out of all the modern entities that understand and create and deal with story and technology quite robustly, Pixar, to me, is the one entity that you can point to that really, really, really gets it. They put story where it belongs main attraction. They put technology where it belongs, in the supporting cast. I have a very strong belief that when technology outpaces story or tries to, things go off the rails. It does not connect to the human experience. It just connects to the technology experience. So what we say, or at least what I say about technology, is it needs to be in a supporting role. As we say in our world of Movies, we say, just happy to be nominated. That's it. And the reason I define Pixar as the one is because out of any entity where you look at like a whole breadth of motion picture equation, these guys know how to make you cry better than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> they know how to pull your heartstrings. And I rate the success of Pixar movies simply by how many times it makes you cry. Like, Up is the big one because I got six full cries, like full on, right? Inside Out, absolutely, you know, some of the others, Bugs Life, Toy Story, they just get you. 
Coco just recently, I walked out of that, I actually screened it with a whole bunch of Disney executives, and I said to myself, that's everything that's right about the world. That's what the world should be. They understand story, and they use amazing technology to get you there. So just as you think about it, I'd say think about it. The rapid evolution of technology requires us to rethink and evolve the many ways we now tell stories. Resh Sidhu, creative director at AKQA, illustrates the trajectory of storytelling from its early applications to the use of immersive technology where the audience becomes the actor inside the story. We have entered an era where VR is fundamentally changing the way we think about storytelling. And all of these projects and all of these experiences, it's important to understand how they are progressing the medium forward. We've shifted from non-linear, from linear storytelling to non-linear narratives. But as VR continues to evolve, I constantly ask myself the question, how do you tell stories in VR? What does that even mean? And I've begun to think very deeply about the notion of storytelling. So deeply, it takes me back to the beginning of storytelling. Storytelling started way back in the early caveman times, and it was really a way for us to make sense of the world. It's part of what makes us human, to tell stories. As Sandra said, I'm a parent. I tell stories to my sons when they were small, and I've been telling stories to them throughout their life as they've grown up. It's a way we make sense of the world. It's not that just that they get us from A to B. They help, us, they help entertain us. They help us live. And eventually, those early tribal stories migrated into myths and what we now know from myths and religions and um, from rituals and myths to now religion. But something happened in the 15th century that changed that, and that was the arrival of the printing press. So what changed? Well, what changed was that the notion of storytelling began to become controlled. It became controlled by the writer. The author controlled the story he wanted to tell you. And as we came into cinema and theatre, the artists, the performers controlled the story that they want you to hear. Right now, I feel like we are in an era of disruption. And it's exciting. VR and mixed reality is disrupting that storytelling process again. Because now you are the camera and you can decide on the story you want to take in. We've moved away from linear uh, storytelling into this uh, spherical space. It takes time to understand how to create new stories and new medium. And I always love playing this film. This is George Millet's Trip to the Moon, because I think we can take so many learnings from early cinema. The story of cinema's first steps provide a number of important takeaways. Back then, similar to us, filmmakers were limited by the technical constraints. But it didn't stop George Millet from sending his audience to the moon. Five years prior to this film, the first cinema movie, I don't even want to call it a movie, the first cinema piece was played in the theater similar to this, to an audience similar to you. It was the arrival of the train. It was literally a train coming into the platform. Every single one of the audience members got up and ran out the theater because they believed that that train was going to hit them in the face. Can you imagine five years later, Miles was imagining a trip to the moon. This is the power of storytelling and imagination. And this is where we are in VR. We haven't even reached, we are only in year five. It took 10 years, a decade, from this film to get to the first full feature length film, Citizen Kane. I'm excited for who's gonna make the first VR Citizen Kane and what that language and what that experience is gonna feel like. Kevin Slavin, director of the MIT Media Lab, visits an early study by Jakob von Uxkul to see how artists look to scientists and scientists look to artists to find the different ways that one can understand the world. Uh, this is Germany in 1934, uh, Jakob von Uxkul. And Uxkul uh, introduces this term called Umwelt. Um, and the Umwelt describes the, uh, subjective, the subjective world of the organism. 
right? That that the that the experience of the world that the that the swordfish has is dictated in part by the apparatus that it has to perceive it. Same thing for me. Same thing for a tick, and so on and so forth. And so what he did, and it was really it's it's trippy what what Uxkul did. It's 1934, and he's like doing drawings um, of like this is how the environment and the umwelt of the honeybee. So this is the environment, which is to say, you know, objectively, this is what's there. But for the honeybee, this is the world as it, as it matters. This is the world as it is perceived. And so some of them he did as drawings, but the really trippy stuff is he's like, it's, you know, it's 1934 and he's like, I, you know, I, I have some, you know, I've been studying the eyes of flies and, and a bunch of things. So he started taking photographs and then using um, uh, manipulations of the printing plates um, around what he understood to be happening in the eyes of the fly. Uh, and, then, and then when that wasn't enough, he started drawing with watercolor over it, um, all in order to try to answer in some way for himself and for the very few people who paid attention to his work at the time, um, what, what are these other planets? Uh, that run parallel to ours. And for all this work, uh, they made his office a cigarette store in an aquarium, um, which is, just shows you that being an academic was always awful. Um, uh, and by the way, um, by the way, it's worth thinking about what provoked these ideas with Uxkul, what provoked even this approach with Uxkul. And, I, you know, who knows? Um, but... What I would say, based on where and when he was around and the people that he was working around, he was probably pretty interested in the work that was very fashionable and new. That was like, you know, had its own conferences just like these, where everybody was like, hey, have you guys heard about cubism? Have you heard about futurism? Have you heard about Eudipatora? Right? Like, and so I think that this is one of those moments, one of those very important moments where Artists look to scientists and scientists look to artists because they both had the same question, which is, how do we understand the world? How do we understand the world? And so, Uxkul says, here's the chandelier seen by the man, uh, and here it is, uh, as best I can tell, as it would be seen uh, by a fly. And he, he's studying living systems, but he's basically making paintings. And in 2018, we are finally at a point uh, where we can make living systems. And what I would argue is, is that the future of storytelling has to be made up of those systems. Our access to technology is now unprecedented. And as an artist, Don Hahn, a major actor in the Disney Renaissance of the 1990s, found any technological means available to him to be a painter, a filmmaker, a writer, and first and foremost, a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I think we should all paint. It's just impossible and wonderful to be a painter. And I use my iPad only. I have an iPad Pro and I use Procreate. Um, I don't use a stylus. I just use my finger. Um, and I just love it. And to me, f filmmaking is like painting and uh, like everything I do in life is like painting. What's amazing right now is a lot of my documentaries I shoot on Canon 5Ds and and, and you, the, the entry level to shooting a documentary and editing it is really low now. You can shoot an entire film. And there was one at Sundance last year on your cell phone. And you can even cut it and score it on your cell phone if your fingers were small enough. Um, <laughs> there's a joke in there, which I won't use. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the ability to enter that world and make a film, and in animation is the same way. You know, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying the technology is easy. Um, and I'm not trying to diminish at all the uh, art of technology that goes into making those movies. Um, but when you, when you can make it um, transparent, I mean, that's the weird thing about animation or filmmaking. It's impossible and hard and grueling and chaotic with a goal of getting rid of all that and suspending your disbelief long enough to get captured in this story about what it is to be human. So you know, you all know how painful it is to be an artist or just do what you do during the day for a living. And yet in filmmaking, the goal is to make the audience forget that. To make the audience forget when I see Roger Rabbit, it was impossible. And yet the audience shouldn't ever have to know that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I love about it. Technology is the means through which artistic expression can be articulated. The symbiosis between art and technology is the subject of Phi's great quest. 
Thank you for listening to Five Perspectives. Join us for our next episode, where we will revisit thinkers and creatives to understand how they see what tomorrow looks like today. To find out more, go to our website, phi-center.com.